With overcrowding becoming a major issue at Staten Island's public schools, the borough will soon be getting 2,000 new school seats, including more than 700 dedicated to the city's brightest young minds. So this has been kind of in the works for several years. It's kind of this rigorous instruction for kids who are maybe just a step ahead of their general education classmates. This is the beginning of a process, right? I've been mm-hmm. talking with Chancellor Banks about this since I took office. I've had a number of engagements with the Chancellor and his team since then in meetings. And I think that what we're in agreement on is pursuing the process to create a K-8 gifted and talented school at this site. Welcome to the Staten Island Advances from the Scene, a podcast bringing you an inside look at the biggest stories on Staten Island with the reporters who cover them. I'm your host, Eric Bascom, and this week I'm joined by Staten Island Advance education reporter Annalise Knudsen to discuss news that the borough will receive its first dedicated gifted and talented school located on the former St. John Villa Academy campus. Thanks for joining me today, Annalise. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, it's been a while since I've had you on the podcast. It felt like for a while, especially during the height of the pandemic, you were really one of our more frequent guests because we had everything always changing with the remote learning and hybrid learning and then returning to the classrooms and all the various protocols and all that. But it seems like, you know, from my point of view, at least, that the schools are pretty much back to normal these days. Do you you feel the same? Yeah, I, I agree. There's really not much in terms of COVID protocols and things like that. So it's kind of like, back to the pre-pandemic education stories that I was doing before. Which is nice, I'm sure, for the student. well, for you, one, but then also for the students to have kind of that sense of normalcy. But we're going to see, I think, for a long time, the long-ranging effects of not time off, but that hybrid learning and people not being in the classrooms, being around their peers, and the effects that that has had on reading scores and stuff like that. So while the pandemic stuff is behind us in the sense of the day-to-day protocols. I think that the impacts are, are probably still being felt and, and will be and will be studied for, for quite some time. But I think at least uh, it's it's nice to be past that in the moment. So, well, thank you again for coming on. And I'm um, talking about the first gifted and talented school coming to Staten Island. And so I didn't really know too much of what that meant. So I was hoping we could start with just talking about what gifted and talented is this program that they have and the differences between there's gifted and talented programs and then there's gifted and talented classes and schools and how all of that works. So to start about what exactly gifted and talented is, it's kind of this rigorous instruction for kids who are maybe just a step ahead of their general education classmates. So the city will allow teachers to be at a faster pace with these students, maybe learn more things than a general education classroom would. So I would just say it's more just rigorous. It's more fast paced for the student who needs that. There's two different types of G&T options for New York City public school parents. So we have the district programs, the citywide programs. The biggest difference is where they are placed and where they exist. So the district programs are the programs that are in a city public school. They're in an existing public school that's already opened. And it's usually just one or two classes at most per grade that are a gifted program. The citywide is every classroom, every class in that school is a gifted and talented class. Gotcha. And so how many of these dedicated schools are there across New York City and and where are they? Because we mentioned that this is going to be the first one on Staten Island and, you know, we're often either the last or one of the last to get something. So I'm curious how large this program is currently and where those schools currently exist. The district programs are basically citywide. But when we think about the citywide programs where every class is a gifted program, there's only five schools in the five boroughs. And I say five boroughs, but there's only existing in three currently not including the the new one that's coming to Staten Island. So there's three in Manhattan, one in Queens, one in Brooklyn. So Bronx and Staten Island currently do not have one. Right. And so you mentioned that some of these existing public schools also offer these classes. Are there schools on Staten Island that are currently offering these? How many there might be if there's obviously too many? Don't expect you to name them all. But I, I was just kind of curious if the, the district programs are currently available here. Yes, there's six district programs in Staten Island. Many of them are actually clustered in the South Shore. There's only one gifted program on the North Shore. 
and that's at PS45. That's in West Brighton. So I think having this citywide program, you know, we're a little bit closer to the to the North Shore here with this new campus, mm-hmm. with this dedicated school. Mm-hmm. So I think that that would be a good option for, I guess, the entire borough to be able to access the school because it is in such a central but not really location. It's not situated in one shore or the other, really. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is something that I know our local elected officials have really been pushing the city on for years of, of getting this gifted and talented school here on Staten Island. So can you talk a little bit about that and who had been pushing for this and why it was so important for them to bring this to Staten Island? I think we would have to go back several years to kind of get the whole picture on how we got to this point. And that's because under the former mayor, Bill de Blasio, he was very against gifted and talented programs. He Mm -hmm. wanted them completely gone, and that sparked outrage, so they were kept. And we had a a change in administration when Eric Adams came as mayor. He brought Chancellor David Banks with him, and they said, okay, you know, we want to expand G&T. There had been a change in admissions processes and things like that to kind of expand opportunities more under de Blasio. And at that point, there were a lot of elected officials on the borough who were calling for more opportunities for gifted and talented. So David Carr, who was our councilman, was very vocal during the campaign when he was running for council. And he very much wanted a gifted and talented. That was like one of his main things he said he hoped to bring if he became council member. And in 2022, he and Borough President Vito Vasella had also written a letter to Chancellor David Banks to ask for this dedicated, gifted school. David Carr represents Mid-Island in the New York City Council. This is the beginning of a process, right? I've been Mm -hmm. talking with Chancellor Banks about this since I took office. I've had a number of engagements with the Chancellor and his team since then in meetings. And I think that what we're in agreement on is pursuing the process to create a K-8 gifted and talented school at this site. It's always nice to see when when Staten Island's elected officials are pushing for a service or a program or initiative that we're not currently included in to actually get that response and get those results and have it coming here to Staten Island. So I'm sure that they're very excited about that and definitely celebrating a, a good win in that regard. So Let's talk about the location of this school. So this is going to be on the campus of the former St. John Villa Academy. And so when St. John Villa was closing, me and you were very close to that story, covering it for weeks, if not months, probably. But for our listeners who either may not remember that or or, or don't have the full story, can you talk to us a little bit about that campus and kind of what happened there in terms of the closing and then how we got to the point now where we're going to have a new public school there? Villa closed back in 2018, which... God, it doesn't feel that long. Oh, my God. We've been here too long. (laughs) We've been here too long. So, you know, that was a story that I had covered since the announcement was made and and what would happen to the students there and what would happen to the campus after was the biggest question I think many people had. Mm -hmm. And not too long after the school closed, the city came and, and swooped up the property and said, we want to buy it. We want to expand and and offer more seats to students on the borough so that's exactly what happened and then a year later the school construction authority which is you know part of new york city had acquired the property and they started plans for for what was going to be going there and that's how we got to the point where they said okay we're going to have 2000 seats we're going to knock down all the buildings on campus because a lot of the buildings that are, were currently there were they were in disrepair there was probably too much work to fix them. So they just figured, let's just knock everything down and start over and start fresh. And the hope was to have elementary, middle, and high school seats, which we need all three on the borough, especially in the area that it's going in. It's in Arakar. And that's a spot where I feel like there's really no high school. There's really no middle school there. There's elementary schools, but obviously we need more seats, especially at the elementary level. Absolutely. And so I I think it's nice to see that in this case, when St. John Villa was closing, there was this huge push from the community that to maintain this as an educational facility, right? And it's funny because we're kind of seeing the same thing right now with St. John's, and it feels like the community is probably going to lose that battle. I had had Jessica on recently to talk about the, the pending sale of that 
property and nothing has been formally announced yet, but it's sounding more and more like that is going to turn into housing, right? And same thing happened though when St. John closed, everyone was like, they want to keep this an educational facility. Let's talk to other higher education. Let's talk to the city about bringing high schools or other schools there. And with Villa, they were able to accomplish that. Not necessarily the same with St. John. So I guess, you know, where 50-50 isn't too bad, batting 500 on that. But um, so let, let's move on because I thought it was interesting that in your reporting, you were kind of talking about, you know, how the schools would be structured at this location, right? And their initial plans had called for one thing, but then once they announced the Gifted and Talented program, it's like, okay, well, is that going to be separate from what the... So just talk a little bit about how those things have changed and and what we know so far and, and what's still a little up in the air. The initial plan was to have this entire education complex, to have two buildings. One would be this standalone elementary school building, and then the second one would be a combined middle and high school, and then they would have a field and, you know, all the amenities that would come with that. And when this was announced, the K-8 gifted and talented school, I was very confused because I was under the impression that this was a middle and high school combination, not an elementary middle school. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the first question of what what's going on there. Plans are changing, and I'm confused, I'm sure. Many people who have probably read my previous stories were if getting confused. If you were confused, I think everyone's so, probably confused. Yes. Yeah, so from what we know so far, and this is um, when I had discussed with David Carr about, you know, this new plan, I said, what, what's going on with the schools? What, what are What is changing? And he was told that the standalone elementary building would be able to house this K-8 gifted and talented school. So, mm. you know, those 700 seats or so would be for gifted and talented I asked if this combined middle and high school was still in the plans or if it would just be high school. Mm -hmm. It's currently unclear. You know, that's something that I'm sure will be discussed going forward, but I'm not sure. I don't know if they're going to even, if they'll have more middle school seats or if it's just going to be high school, but that second building was supposed to hold 1,200 seats or so. So that's a big building. So I guess we'll have to wait and see what the city comes up with. Gotcha. And so let's talk a little bit more about the the gifted and talented program and the dedicated schools and such. But what I'm curious about is the application process and, and what it's like applying for one of these programs, particularly because you mentioned that the school will be serving grades K through eight. So I'm like, how do you evaluate a kindergartner or a first grader to see if they qualify for this kind of program? I, it seems a little, it makes more sense to me when you're like, okay, you're testing into a standard or like a special high school, right? If you're testing to get into Staten Island Tech or something like that, it's like, okay, these kids have been in school for a long time. They've gone through a bunch of things. They can take these standardized tests to kind of gauge the results and they have averages and all of these kind of stuff. How do you tell if a fifth grader is qualifies for a gifted and talented program? So, there actually used to be a test for gifted and talented years ago for the kindergarten for kindergarten Uh so they were you know four years old typically because it was before you entered kindergarten yeah yeah and again that was that was one of the reasons why de blasio had had wanted to nix the whole thing that was one of several reasons that's why admissions had changed Mm -hmm. there's no test anymore there's no test to get into a program so how it works is if a parent is interested and they feel like their child is maybe more advanced, they're probably in pre-K mm-hmm. and they can apply for a gifted and talented program when they're applying for kindergarten. Mm-hmm. And what will happen from there is if they're in a DOE pre-K program, they'll ask the teacher, they'll say, do you think this child is at this level of being in an advanced program? If you're not in like a DOE program, you're in a private preschool, they'll send someone from the DOE to evaluate the child. And there's kind of like a whole process. It's pretty complicated. So I would urge anyone listening, if they are interested, to really go to the DOE's gifted and talented portion of their website to really look at how everything works for for the kindergarten entry because there are second entry points for programs. There's also first grade through third grade that a student can also enter. It's not just before kindergarten. There's other entry points, which again, were added recently. Gotcha. But for now, kids who are you going to a K-8 to school are not getting evaluated to enter in at sixth grade, for example. So if you're entering, you're entering at the elementary school level. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. 
And so, you know, we're so excited because we're finally getting this school here on Staten Island. But as you, I think, kind of touched upon earlier, these are citywide programs and people from all over the city can be placed in these gifted and talented schools in different boroughs, right? And so it's great, obviously, that we're getting one here on Staten Island, but it sounds like there's no way to ensure that it's going to be Staten Island students who are actually placed there. So I'm curious if there is any kind of like priority given to borough residents or if they will have X amount of students will be from Staten Island or or just anything like that. That's unclear at the moment. (laughs) Like you said, the citywide programs are open to all students. There's no district priorities that exist for the citywide programs. I had asked David Carr if there was a possibility that there could be some type of priority admissions there. Again, that's something that that's part of programming as we get closer to when it would eventually open. So again, that's very unclear right now. It's not impossible. He had said to me, he assumes that it would skew, of course, more towards Staten Island students, maybe a certain percentage, of course, a lot of Staten Island parents I'm going to assume will be really interested in this program. But I wouldn't be surprised if we had a lot of people, you know, from over the bridge in Brooklyn Mm -hmm. who are very interested and would want to go to a program like the one that will open here. So as of right now, if we're following all the other citywide programs, there are no district priorities. There's no borough priorities there. Right. And, uh, you know, you make a good point about Brooklyn, particularly because the location of the school, it actually wouldn't be too too bad for students from Brooklyn to try and get over here because it's right next to the bridge. The location of it in that regard, like if it was all the way down on the South Shore, right, it would take them over an hour probably to get to school. But if you just have to hop over the bridge, there's buses that go back and forth and stop in that area. So that's something I hadn't considered. But let's talk a little bit about the next steps. What else needs to be done here? And when are we expecting the school to actually open? The, the city has already started construction on the site. So that's in progress. Next steps are just continuing construction. They've knocked down everything, as far as I know. Everything is you know, f- kind of flattened. And it's a very hilly site, it is. actually. It so definitely is. I know that there's some type of things that they need to do to be able to build things properly right. on, on a site like that, level, the level ground, things yeah. like that. So I know that's going to be taking a while. As of now, the gifted and talented K-8 school is slated to open in 2029. Again, with how the structure of these buildings has been changed, the elementary initially was supposed to be opening in 2030, and the middle high school combination was supposed to open in 2029. Obviously, things are changing. Right. But the K K to 8, I was told, would be opening in 2029. So I'm not sure if that means the other school will be delayed by a year or if the entire complex will open in 2029. Again, it's still pretty far away. Yeah. So again, more to more to come on what we can expect and how things will be opening. Yeah, no, it definitely is still a bit of a ways out. And so that actually brings me to the last thing I wanted to talk about before we go here, which is you've been doing some reporting recently on overcrowding at the schools on Staten Island. And you've mentioned, I think offline, actually, before we started about some of the new class size requirements and And the need to build these new schools on Staten Island, and this isn't the only one that we have coming, right? And so can you just tell us a little bit about the state of the schools right now and and what the city is trying to do in in terms of adding more seats to try and address those issues? Yes, I had actually done a few overcrowded school stories looking at the state of how many students are in every elementary, middle, and high school. So if people want to read that, that's on silab.com. And a lot of them are over that 100% threshold, right? So you, you really want to be below that because that means you just have too many students in a classroom, not enough probably teachers to be able to, you know, properly educate. I'm not, I'm not saying that against the teachers. But, no, of course. You know, but... the more students, the more difficult it becomes. And the state has this new class size law that requires a certain number of students in each grade and each grade level in each school. So I know that that's why the city is kind of ramping up efforts to add these new school seats all over. And we especially see a lot of overcrowding in the elementary levels. I want to say it's because we have a lot of older buildings that weren't built to have the capacity of the amount of people that are living on the borough. We think about these old schools. And I want to say that's why the city is always looking out for school sites, you know, whether that's 
school buildings that have closed, um, you know, like the private schools and making these annex sites and constructing all these brand new buildings to help ease this overcrowding while also, you know, following the state laws that are going into place. And we can see that really clearly with the villa property. Mm -hmm. You know, that was purchased many years ago before this class size law (laughs) was even introduced. So it's just like they saw this issue, you know, like it was there was always an issue of overcrowding on the borough. We've seen a lot of school buildings have that have opened in the recent years, and we're still going to see going forward all these new school buildings like in Travis with PS26, very, very overcrowded over there. Mm -hmm. They're getting a brand new school building right a block over. Mm -hmm. So creating the school seats is more important than ever. That's a very big priority for the city. And, you know, it'll create more jobs for people in the borough here, at least. Yeah, absolutely. You made a great point about the older buildings being built at a time when the population was so much lower here. I hadn't really thought about it, but some of the schools on Staten Island have been around 50, 75, even I think over 100, 100 years, years, some of them. We went to PS30, right? I feel like I remember we them. We had the centennial when I was in fourth grade. Yeah, so. I was the 100th graduating class, yes. which was very exciting. <laughs> but so, yeah, so when you think about it, that school was built a hundred years ago, a hundred plus years ago mm-hmm. at this point. And so at that time, how many houses were there really in Westerly? And now you see all the development we have going on all over the place. So neighborhoods where the schools was built to have, you know, serve X amount of students. Now they probably have twice as many people living in that neighborhood. And so that, that that's a really good point and, and just kind of highlights the need for the city to ramp things up, especially as they try to comply with new laws. And so lots going on here and great reporting by you as always. So I want to thank you for joining me and, and hopefully we can have you back on soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Staten Island Advances from the scene. If you like what you've heard, please make sure to rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit SILive.com for the latest on all these stories and more. Thank you for supporting local journalism.